They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You can play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. Let's see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, hey, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at BPM. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. And again, just for a quick reminder that this is the place that is Black Power Media is the place where we do intend to restore a Black radical public sphere and to bring radicalism and revolutionary redefinition back to the phrase Black Power as it was originally intended. So welcome uh, to those who are able to join us live. Don't be stingy. Jump on in and invite folks to uh, come on in and join you. Uh, please put this in your socials, like, share, subscribe. Do all that you can to support uh, the channel and let folks know about this particular program about to go off today. Uh, and of course, please be in touch with blackpowermedia.org as well where you can find everything you need from multiple ways of support, material, immaterial. But uh, if you have issues or, or proposals or suggestions, or you want to reach out to individual hosts or the collective, all of that is possible through blackpowermedia.org. So uh, I hope folks have gotten a chance to see the first two parts of Dear Mama. Uh, uh, Daruba, I'm expecting to be here at any moment. Um, but when I saw that it was it was happening, I, I you know any excuse to reach out to Daruba bin Wahad, who just in case folks aren't aware, uh, my I think personal living favorite political philosopher, theorist, activist, organizer. Um, not that it matters, not that we have to pick one, but but just 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 you know, someone that I always and we always around here like to check in with as much as possible. Former member of the Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army, political prisoner of more than 19 years. He was part of the Panther 21 trial, uh, about which this documentary does talk some, and was of course a comrade of Afini Shakur, about which this documentary does talk some. And uh Again, any excuse to get Daruba around. Uh, so I thought, you know, why not have someone? I'll admit, I predicted the documentary. I've only, the, the first two or five parts are all that's been released, but I'll admit that I expected it to be far worse than it was or has been so far. Uh, but especially is, is my point as part of the Vernon philosophy of Black media avoidance. <clears throat> especially when you like something that is being offered in this context of colonial hostility and antagonism, you must be more critical and must engage a deeper analysis of both the product, some maybe some self-criticism, uh, but also, uh, 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 and I think engage in more discussion so we'll be bringing this to my students. I definitely wanted to bring it here. Um, but this is something that both in terms of the attempt by those in power, 
but also by um, those, I think, trying to attempt to bring truth through what do you say in um, what movie was it? We talked about walking through the raindrops. We, you know, in that case, it was talking about intelligence agencies and their whatever, but the idea of walking through, in, 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 but if, if there's, there's, there is this attempt, I think we can see of people, well-meaning people trying to push messages through the raindrops. And this to me, I think I told uh, Geechee uh, in what I write to him. Uh, I forgot it. Where would I write it? Because I, I, I actually like what I, what I wrote, but I I said that I think it's the most sophisticated. This documentary might be the most sophisticated challenge to the Vernon philosophy, uh, and the most sophisticated discussion of the Black Panther Party that I've seen in commercial media. I think I would say that. I think so far I would say that. So far in these first two episodes, I do. I think we've gotten. In terms of commercial media, I'm talking about in terms of like PBS, in terms of like, um, and especially for something that wasn't, isn't supposed to be directly about the Panthers. It almost feels in a way kind of like the Ali film with Will Smith, where I felt like you got more of an honest depiction of Malcolm X in that film than you did in Spike Lee's or in so many of these other things. A short, relative, you know, more or less cameo role, but in terms of the display of his actual politics is internationalism and, and you got more of that there. And I'm getting a feeling in this that this is this might be the case with the BPP. I'm not saying it's great. I'm not saying it's good. It certainly doesn't do what we need to do. And it certainly doesn't do what we at BPM do do. Like we like we fill in so many of the gaps, uh uh intentional and otherwise, that these kinds of but 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 that's why I think BPM is so important and why I've always wanted to be a part of something like this because of the increase, what I've sort of seen would be the case. The it's predictable; they will get better. And even just going back to what we talked about the other day with the with the Frank Kitson work, shout out to Obert Tashaka for putting me on and us on to that. But the 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 idea that that they that he said then fifty years ago, increasing resources because of the continued need for the competition of resources increasing resources will have to continue to be put into propaganda to counter the potential for insurgents and ultimately um subversives to 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 take hold because you can even see it with something like this if 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 <clears throat> was it Alan Hughes I think one of half of the Hughes brothers if if the Hughes if he had this much more political education and this much less corporate colonial overlording, this series might be something, one of the pieces that that becomes, you know, like like a, a digital blood in my eye. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, because this thing, it, it hits a couple moments where, and I'm still, so Daruba and I were having this back and forth in the chat trying to, and he said something, I meant to ask, I, 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 he said something that was, that was kind of dope given the, 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 here we go. So here we go. Daruba's coming in. Uh, uh, so I'll just, I'll bring him on having already basically given the introduction and um, Daruba, good to see you again. How you feeling? Can you hear me? And you have to unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm on my cell phone because I can't seem to get your stream on my laptop. Well, that that's never going to be a better option. I don't know what, what that means. I, um, yeah, maybe we'll have to do audio only then. Uh, just to make it easier, if that's going to be the case, because I don't think uh, the camera is going to the the, the video is going to keep up. Uh, but if the audio sounds good, I think we'll be good there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I could hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Can you hear me? 
I do hear you. you and that's why I'm saying we might have to do this audio only because the video's lagging. I think, but we'll I think see. I'm when getting you, get the, you on Facebook. Yeah, I'm streaming. The show is streaming to Facebook, but you should probably, but you're not in, you're not, that's not the studio. You you, you're gonna, I do hear you. That is a, yeah, he does have a flossy sweater though, doesn't he? I'm sorry. <laughs> hear me i do hear you but i'm not thinking you're hearing me and i think you should try the the link through the laptop again if at all possible because it, it can't up. yeah yeah i know it can't Hello? It, it, it's it, yeah so daruba can you try the uh laptop again because there's no way the phone's going to be better and this is and i don't and and yeah this is it so i'm um let's see if we can get daruba to come on via that laptop because now he's completely frozen in the, in the uh but um but we were trying to set up a time but i had to reschedule the time i had for, i forgot about my my uh um uh the i thought it was next week but the the my daughter had a piano recital this morning she killed it by the way she killed it but um so I was asking Daruba for another. Um, could we could we push it back? And then we I was having you know having a hard time picking the the you know figuring out like what time would be you know. And he said you know let's you know let's keep it at twelve. Stop being so indecisive. I said I said I said this is perfect, and 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 it sounds it's that's perfect coming from somebody like Daruba. Stop being indecisive. I was like, I'm just trying to pick the right tip, but stop being indecisive. Sometimes you got to move. Sometimes you got to stick with the plan and move. <laughs> Daruba, is there any chance you could you could go, come back on through the laptop? Uh, could you try that link. again? Or maybe just audio? On my, on my link. <laughs> Can we try just doing it with 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 uh, without the camera, maybe, and just do it with just audio? We can do it with the camera, but you. I need to. Just no, I'm wondering if it's email. if you turn the if you turn the. It's on my cell phone. The I mean I can send the link. You if you're okay. This is what I think I heard you saying. What I think I, I'm. What I think I heard you saying is you need the link to go, to your Gmail, and not through the chat we had. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send it over there. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is send you the link through the email, through email and then, um, Will so let's see. Link. All right, and then that should help you get. Maybe that'll help. <clears throat> By the way, everybody, in case in Daruba, if you don't know, you can get. Uh, you can have a WhatsApp on desktop. Thank you very much. She did very well. She doesn't like. She's she's a little shy. She's a little. She was a little nervous, but you know, um, what's up, Kalanji? But she. Um, by the way, don't forget tomorrow, Kalanji and I are gonna be hosting a, a, a two-hour Mumia birthday extravaganza on Gorilla Intellectual University tomorrow at eight a.m. Um, but. Uh, um, all right, so let me just, while we're waiting for Deruba, let me do a couple more of the background stuff. Although maybe I thought he would want to hear this because I don't think he's had a chance to see this either. So I'm going to give him a couple of minutes uh, before I was going to go through some of the backdrop of, of the of the this series. But let me just wait for him for a minute. Um, I am, yeah. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then we will, that is, uh, Kalanji and I will resume for non Wretched of the Earth after after uh, we do, we take care of the Mumia birthday celebration. All right, here we go. Let's try again. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. And I think that 
you, you, I think I, yeah, that this, works. Good. We, I'm on my cell phone, but it's all it's all good. All right, somehow that's even better. It's good to see you, man. It's always good to see you. I hope all is relatively well. Yeah, it's good to see you too, man. You know, I just, I, I think, I, I think that, um, I thought my phones were working, but I see they're not. Well, this is I working got, well. This uh -huh. actually looks good. This actually works well. If you can hear me, it probably, and maybe if you did, you probably want to keep. Oh, the I can hear you in. well. Okay. All right. Wait, oh man, don't, don't, don't. You don't had it good, man. Right? Yeah, you, you. Now we're looking at the ceiling. You had it good, man. I'm turning. I'm turning the volume up. <laughs> All right, good, good. There we go. Um, so I did some of the the introductory stuff. I was just, you know, yeah, absolutely. Warrior salute. All of that good stuff. Uh, really appreciate you, Daruba. Um, and uh, uh, as I was saying, any excuse to, to reach out to you, uh, I'm always looking for. So when I saw this was coming, I said, man, let me try to let's 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 try to work this work around this a little bit. So if you like, I can say a couple of things about the 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 series or the documentary. Uh, and but we've already talked about I have the the sort of the, the, the initial big question to ask you to get things started. But uh, um, uh let me know how that works for you, if that's cool, if, or if you want to just jump in and say something off the top. No, okay. I didn't watch it, so I have nothing to say. Off okay. The well, just yeah, okay. Um, so just so just a couple things. Uh, um, from one story, just a little bit of background. Uh, the film is is put together by one and a half of the 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 famous Hughes brothers. For folks maybe remember from my generation. Uh, light-skinned twins who were involved with a lot of black films and video making and menace to society, et cetera, and so forth. The Book of Eli and uh, uh, a number of other things. Um, and of course, it, it was odd. And they talk a little bit about this in the, in the documentary. They talk in, in episode two. They pause for a minute to talk about this. But it, you know, some of us will remember that Pac uh, and more more notably, ten of his homeboys beat down Alan Hughes. Um, over the the beef they were having over the film Menace to Society and what was supposed to have been Pac's role in that movie, uh, so so he talks a little bit about having to to hesitate to catch up to the idea that that he would even do this this documentary that is Hughes. You know, he had had you know they had, at one point was tight with Pac, then they, he gets of course he, he gets. Quit? He doesn't really explain that other than to simply say that uh something you know what he doesn't give a fully good answer at least not yet so far all he really says to that is you know something like you know we had a good relationship i was tight with him for a long time but that five minutes of that beating you know and then we didn't talk for you know for the rest of his life and he said but he he is something maybe about Pac being an important figure historically he certainly didn't say anything like I needed a check, I needed a gig, yeah, I needed, Pop, you know. Pop being an important figure historically, historically how, how so? Well, I'm saying he didn't go into that. We could we could maybe have that discussion or that argument, but I'm just saying, what I'm saying is I think he maybe just sort of alluded to that, did Hughes. He didn't really give an explanation to answer your question, like why did he do it? He, he, he talked not long, it's only a few minutes, but he talked more about why he wouldn't have done it. Uh, um, but he didn't really clarify. That's a good question. I didn't. I didn't get that he really clarified why he ultimately did do it. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, there are two sisters involved. Uh, one, uh, Winter Dunn, is an award-winning director who directs this, and uh, Charmaine Cleveland is the writer. And I wanted to highlight those three people because whatever I know or don't know of them, or have seen or haven't seen or heard from them, as I was saying before you got on here. So far, Daruba, and I'm very glad we can have this conversation. This, to me, is so far, I think, the most sophisticated and challenging commercial media depiction of the Panther Party that I've ever seen. And <laughs> even though the, par the party is not the, the focus, that may be why. When they talk about Afeni and when they talk about the, the party and the and even the politics of the party a little bit, and I'm not saying it does a good job or enough of a job. I'm just saying in terms of commercial media, relative to commercial but, but, media, it does it offers up a real challenge. And, I and it's, it's I a sophisticated look. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go I ahead. 
I didn't see it, but I talked to two people that was a, who first first of all one sister who who knew Tupac and the fainting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In fact, Tupac lived with us uh, um, for a while. You know, I knew Fanny very well, mm-hmm. um, and I know about her relationship in the party. Mm-hmm. But I my views about that. Of course, we could talk about those things, those experiences. But um, one of the things uh, the sister noted was that when she watched it, she realized she wasn't watching a documentary. She was watching a movie. That's interesting. And Did- when I and, and, and as I passed by my um, my coach. Uh, oh, damn. He got a call and took him off the thing. So just to be clear. I, Okay, go ahead. You back? Yeah, she mentioned. She mentioned. Yeah, that was that was somebody calling. I know you're gonna have to. You you might wanna you might wanna put your phone on do not disturb if you get a chance because uh-huh. it's probably gonna keep happening every time they call. Yeah, it's that's, gonna that's cut probably you off. because that's probably because the brothers downstairs waiting. <laughs> Are you supposed to be going somewhere? No, I'm going. I ain't going nowhere till we finish. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. To, I ain't going nowhere. Okay. To, I ain't know I ain't going nowhere till the bald headed host tell me it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, okay. So, so I think he got the hint. Uh, anyway, okay, so, all right. So, so, so anyway, so, so what I'm saying is, I passed by while the sister was watching it, and and so I got a couple of her uh, initial impressions. But why did she say she thought it was a movie? Could you? Did she say more about that? I'm interested to hear more. I about know why what, what she. The, I, I know why she could say it was a movie. And that's the very reason why I didn't want to watch it. Okay. And that's because people f- don't fully understand the um, the players in a lot of the Cointel Pro, pro so called what, what came out as the Cointel Pro dramas and the consequences of the B, the first and second BLA wars is that some people were faking in the game, mm-hmm. some people were on stage, some people were acting. And Tupac was one of them, and Tupac wasn't even born yet. So then, so 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 we need to understand that um, that hmm, the events aren't what you've seen. All that's not real is camouflage. And when we talk about this, and you just had a program on about the media and the global village and and, and McEwen. And if you mm-hmm. noticed, I and you knew me for years. I've been quoting McEwen for years about global mm-hmm. village and that the medium has become the message. Mm-hmm. And, and and that perception has become reality. We, I wrote a piece um, back about maybe 25 years ago called Stealth History and how mm-hmm. and how they had informers writing books talking about the Black Panther Party. You have people that, you know, you, I mean, you have a plethora of books and observations and videos that came out about, you know, in my time in the party. I mean, when you look at some of the interviews, I heard some of the interviews in in the, in the Tupac um, uh, movie, and those, a lot of those interviews were old. They were old interviews, you know, and and they were interviews in in in, in hmm, that in many ways, in retrospect, uh, you know, we look back at things and we put the best construction on it in order to serve our needs in the present. You see, and um, in order to um, you know accept certain things that are unacceptable. The first thing that we need to understand that the repression of the Black Panther Party and and the and the and the Black Liberation Army were struggles and and and, and battles that we did not win. So for a revolutionary to survive a revolutionary struggle and 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 didn't without coming out on top as the victor is a serious situation. I know a lot of revolutionaries, when I used to talk to Blood, may Allah be pleased with him, who passed away, when I talked to my comrades like Sekou, you know, it ain't easy, you know, being a revolutionary surviving a, a defeated rev, a revolutionary uh, cause. Especially when you see the generation that we have today, they saw off as church music. And, 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 and not only that, their intent on rewriting history in a way that validates their position and their non-position and their inability to confront the political and geopolitical realities of today. You see, and and people really don't fully understand that when Tupac, Tupac was in his mother's stomach, Afeni Shakur, when we was on the Panther 21 trial, that Afeni Shakur, you know, was one of our comrades at that time who did had absolutely nothing to do with the conspiracy charge, nothing. 
Yeah, the absolute only reason she was there was because of Lumumba Shakur. That was his wife. Oh wow. D the organizing. Okay. It had nothing to yeah. do with her. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Start again, because start again, because I you you I want to get that clean when you when you get back on, we'll ask you to start again because you're getting a call apparently or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I got to start again. Okay. okay. So, yeah, so you I'm were saying, saying I just because got a, she's... I just got a correction from my coach and said the Tupac was, I was about to get hit in the head with a baseball bat. I said, she said that Tupac was, you, know, you got these threatening people around here. That Tupac wasn't in her stomach. It was in her womb. My bad. Okay. Right on. I, yeah, I, Okay, I heard that, but didn't didn't want to stop the flow. But anyway, I'm so, glad I'm, I'm so, glad, so glad for I'm the correction. Saying. But 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 she is depicted. So that's interesting. You would say it that way. She is she is very much depicted in this series so far as as far more than. And I'm not saying you meant to do it this way. We're doing it this way. But she's not depicted as just being Lamumba's wife. She's depicted as very much being in the leadership, being being very much. Um, uh, um, involved in running things. They talk about when the New York chapter was decimated, that she picked up a lot of the pieces and, and held it together more as much as, as anyone, um, even as, as, as they passingly, and this is what I don't like, they did this again, they passingly let it just go that that Huey was out of jail and crazy is how they depicted it. Uh, let me say- And I'm not, and I'm not saying, this, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I know I know my comrades, the ones that are still alive. You know, I understand, you know, um how they how how they might want to um 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 try to get across a message to another generation to pick up the struggle, especially young black women. But but I'm I I'm trying to explain here that um <clears throat> a feigning <clears throat> When the Panther Twenty One was were, were were arrested on April, I think it was April first, April second, nineteen sixty nine, they they raided all of our houses and they brought us all downtown in separate. You know, they raided all of the places. And the only one that that escaped was Sekou. He escaped and ultimately wound up in North Africa with the um, Black Panther Party's uh, um, consulate there in Algeria. Okay, that was Sekou Odinga. He was the only one to escape. Okay, and all of us were busted, including Nafani. <clears throat> and Nafani was was arrested in Lumumba Shakur's house apartment. Hmm? If you look at the Panther Twenty One indictment, um, in terms of conspiracy and overt acts, I don't think you see Nafani Shakur mentioned at all as being a co-conspirator in the act, she was busted with us. And there was paraphernalia that was taken from Lumumba's uh, apartment, harmless paraphernalia, African memorabilia, a sword on the wall and all of this stuff, because they really found very few weapons when they arrested us. All of the explosives and stuff that they claim that, that we had to order to initiate these bombings on the Easter holidays was all bogus. It was, it was planted by a NYPD informer in the Bronx, um, at you know, who who had a relationship with Lumumba, uh, uh, um, you know, a trusted relationship. He was a he was an NYPD undercover agent, uh, Ralph White. They called him Yeboa Sudan. He was an undercover police detective, and he's the one that put the um, the, the 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 false dynamite into a, a tenants organization office and stashed it. And so they used that as a pretext to say that we was, this was a conspiracy. Beginning to Afeni, Afeni was scooped up along with Jamal, along with Shaba Om, both of who were in the uh, movie, I'm told. Uh, uh, Jamal Joseph uh, was 15 years old or 16 or something like that. So was Shaba. So they didn't, they didn't stand trial. And they were put on, uh, they were put in, um, on Rikers Island as youthful offense, as you as youth. They were separated from us. And when we were first arrested, David Hilliard, whom I intend to write about, I'm trying to get it out before he passes. So people will say, well, why didn't you say this while he was alive? You know, um, 
David Hilliard and um and who else came with him? Aha. Uh -huh. David Hilliard and the chairman of the party, Bobby Seal, came to New York hmm? when we were arrested, after we were arrested. And they and and our lawyers, Gerald Leftcourt, William Kunstler, uh managed to get uh David into the prison to see me as a legal advisor. When I was in isolation in the tombs, the Manhattan House of Detention called the tombs. And he came to see me and he said, um, he said, Daruba, you know, we intend to shut down the, the Black Panther chapter in New York because it's riddled with informants. You know, it's riddled with informants, uh, undercover uh, uh, police and everything. And I pleaded with him. I said, David, you know, you can't, we shouldn't do that. Because New York, Harlem is, is, is the seat of Pan-African uh, consciousness. It's the seat of, of, of black activism and, 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 and culture, black uh, uh, culture. Marcus Garvey marched down the streets in Harlem. Malcolm X taught on the corner of 125th Street and Lenox in Harlem, 125th Street, 7th Avenue in Harlem, long before the state office building was there. So I pleaded with him, I said, just on his face to close the Black Panther Party office down in Manhattan would be, you know, a, a serious strategic and tactical blunder. He agreed with me and they sent two knuckleheads, and I'm gonna say that, Thomas Jolly and Robert Bay, two knuckleheads from California to run the New York chapter, okay? Now, we're in prison. This was before we were bailed out. Um, and because I was the field secretary at that time, the Central Committee and Huey and them uh, I thought that I should get bailed out first you know, in order to speak and all of this stuff. We all had the same bail, 100,000. But I believe maybe a Faney might have had 50,000. My memory doesn't really um, say that she didn't, um, but I think she might have had 50,000 or whatever. I don't think they make that claim. I don't think they, I think they left it at 100,000 according to the series. I don't recall them making a distinction, but they did spe specify that it was 100,000, at least initially. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So we sat down as a collective in the prison because the lawyers, the only time we could get together is when they called for, we had to go to the court. We were all separated in different houses of detention in New York initially. So the lawyers had to make motions in the court so that we could all meet at one time so that they could prepare the case. Okay. And, um, and, 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 and so, we agreed that as the party began to raise money, you know, uh, the, the def we had the Panther 21 Defense Committee uh, uh, was formed. It became a very uh, lucrative defense committee. It became so lucrative, in fact, that David Hilliard and the Central Committee moved the leadership of the Panther 21 Defense Committee out of New York into California so that they could make sure that they could control the funds that were coming to the Panther 21 Defense Committee. And uh, people don't know that. Huh? And so that led to a lot of animosity with the brothers and sisters, the brothers that were in prison because they felt they were, they were being sidelined uh, uh, by, the, by, the, by the Central Committee and they were from California and all of this stuff, which we're gonna get into later about California and about the New York uh, Panther Party in the West Coast. And, and this is something that's, that's, that's cultural in the African community, in the African um, um, colony in the United States, is that there's always been a distinct uh, a, a contradiction, a conflict between the East and West Coast because of the way that Black people moved into California at the beginning of, of, of the Second World War. And, um, and know how those communities coalesced. Most of the Black folks that moved there uh, at, at that period were uh, were from the south. Were from Louisiana and Texas, and from the south. And the police were crackers from the south, and they moved with them. Huh? So, um, you know, the origins of the Black Panther Party on the West Coast had was unique in terms of why it arose there and how it arose there and why it spread. Of course, which I'm going to go into in my in my bio a story. I don't call it a biograph a, a biography because it's the story of my generation and not just me. You see, I'm, I believe I'm a product of my generation and I don't believe I'm self-made in that respect. So have, I, I'm digressing. So what I'm trying to say is we got together when we, when we were raising the money 
churches came forward and put up bail money and everything. So we said, well, how is this going to be spent? How How is it going to be dealt with? The party, the Central Committee agreed that I should come out first. And we agreed in Panther 21 amongst ourselves that, that the two sisters should get out first, Joan Bird and the Fannie Shakur. Why? Because the Fannie was articulate. A Fannie did have a, 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 a um, people skills. She, she she could get people to identify more with our cause because you know we were painted into the corner as agents of of of, of Cuban violent revolu revolution. Go back and look at the period. We were we we're in the editorial pages in the New York Times. The uh, those two points very quickly they do not make in the series. They they make no mention of the threat that you pose in, in relation to Cuba, and they make they don't mention. I don't believe they mention Joan Burr's name at all. Just to quickly point that out. Well, Joan Bird is the only one that actually that was actually named in the indictment for having done something. Because it was Joan Bird who was arrested when Sekou Odinga escaped hmm. um, from, um, for, I believe it was uh, Morningside Heights or um, up on the um, uh, west side by the river. They claimed that we were going to, we were trying to ambush the police across the river. At okay, the they did. I was wrong. Apparently, they did mention her name. Okay, my apologies. Mm -hmm. And so, so we agreed that if there was a hundred thousand, because the sisters' bail, I believe, were fifty thousand. So we agreed that they should try to get out first, right? So that's what we did. We agreed to that, and and the central committee went along, and so Fanny did get out first. The money, the bail money that I would have, they would have used on me, we gave to her. And later on, Abby Hoffman, who wrote a book called "Steal This Book," um, put up all of his 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 money, the money, the advance for his book for my bail. So it was Abby Hoffman that actually bailed me out of prison. Hmm. Is it? And it was the. They definitely did not mention that part. But they didn't know that part. <laughs> you see, you have to understand. Stealth history is a motherfucker. Mm. You see. And, and and that's why I asked you, why did this brother all of a sudden decide to do this movie about mm -hmm. Shakur and Tupac, you understand, at this particular time when black folks can, um, everybody is talking all of that, um, you know, no justice, no peace, as Kalanji pointed out, but our conditions haven't changed. Ain't nobody walking that walk. You got sisters that's talking about how black men are part of the oppressive patriarchal structure and all of this stuff. So that was the need for Elaine Brown, who, <clears throat> of Elaine, uh, Elaine Brown or Fanny Shakur, to be brought to the forefront. I mean, you even have sisters that said 75 or 70% of the Black Panther Party were females. Where did they get that figure from? Where did they get that? They pulled it out their bra? Where did they get that figure from? How do you know that? Because back in the day, when people asked us about the Black Panther Party and its membership, we said those who those who say don't know and those who know don't say. Okay? Because the, the majority, and if you look at all the political prisoners, if you look at all the political cases of the Black Panther, of, of Black Panther Party members, how many of those indictments were, 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 were female only? How many? 75%, if, 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 if seven out of every 10 members in the Black Panther Party was female, how did the repression just wind up on males? Mm -hmm. it's, a total, it's a total reassessment of history in order to put up certain things ahead of reality. That's not to say that the sisters in the party weren't our comrades and didn't constitute a large percentage of the party. They did, okay? But there's certain work in the party, you could call it sexism or patriarchy or whatever. There's certain types of work, whether it was security, whether it was how we sold papers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, that, determined, that determined, you know, who did what, you see? And like you say, you know, um, I know on the on the on the um, in the movie, or I would I was told that you know, Afeni was portrayed as a section leader in the black. Mm -hmm. Man. Yeah, she was a Harlem section leader. So I say, okay, cool. You. Oh, they blowing up the it's phone. You. Hold on, say that again. Say that part again. You because we didn't hear. It. Yeah, she was. She I, honestly, off the top of my head, I don't remember if they called her specifically a section leader or what title, but they it was made very clear that she was very much in the leadership. 
Uh, well, it was, uh, it was after she was bailed out. We would right. We got her out of jail that she had to speak for mm -hmm. the party. So mm -hmm. she traveled to universities. She traveled around speaking for the political prison, speaking for her comrades in prison. And 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 in that sense, she had to take a leadership role. You see, um, one of the main, one of the most um, sterling section female section leaders in the Black Panther Party at that time out of New York was a uh, Diane Jenkins. She was the section. She ran the Brooklyn uh, branch of the Black Panther Party. That Abdul um, Abdul Majid and um, and and other comrades were subordinate to her. Okay, so having a female section leader is not a big deal, but what we do is we enhance history based on ignorance or based on the wanting to raise people to a certain level that they really weren't at because we need heroes and sheroes in our history. We need that, and it's not it's not it's not cool, and it's not necessary to break them down. It's not necessary to to show their weaknesses because we all got weaknesses and 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 made mistakes. You see what I'm saying? But the thing is, is that certain people capitalize on these weaknesses and translate them into uh, um, virtues as if these weaknesses were what led the party. These weaknesses is what made this person the leader. That's not true. It's the, and, and, and if you understand anything about the Panther 21 trial, if you notice when Setuweo, Jamal, and myself, when we did not appear for court in court, um, they put everybody back in jail that was that was in court. They put a fanny back in jail and everything. And and so the Panther 21 that were in jail, uh, Lumumba Shakur, Kwando Kinshasa, and all of these brothers that were in jail, they felt that they were abandoned by by myself and and everything, and and but they didn't understand nothing about COINTELPRO. They didn't understand nothing about the contracts that were put on our heads by the knuckleheads from the West Coast. They didn't understand anything about um about how we would react to their attitude towards that. Because if you remember, if you know the history, you remember the Panther Twenty One released a statement. That broke. That was the straw that broke the camel's back in the split of the Black Panther Party. They released a statement saying that the Weather Underground white kids were now the revolutionary leadership in America, and not the Black Panther Party. And I begged them not to do that, and they wanted to do that because they felt abandoned by Huey and those brothers on the West Coast. Because as I said earlier, they were they were ripping off all the money for the Panther Twenty One Defense Committee. So, so the series, just very quickly, the series. They don't make it nearly as plain as you just did. They don't. They they um, uh, only passingly mention your name, and not in reference to to that specific point you were just making. Uh, but they do say they they do bring up the 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 idea that those who are still locked up were not confident enough that those that were outside were doing enough to get them free. They do make the point that Huey, again, having been described just as as out and crazy, uh, was was misappropriating funds from the 21 to his stuff. Um, and I'm not saying that again, my, quickly, I'm not attempting to say that Huey is is flawless or not deserving of criticism. I just don't like in these kinds of, of the products reason for that, though, where they just do that. They don't go into any detail. They don't, uh -huh. they don't, and they don't and flesh it. And the reason why they don't go and into it, detail, right. the reason mm -hmm. why they don't go into detail is stealth history, the necessity right. to rewrite history in order to justify not doing shit in the present. Huh? Okay, look, look you got to understand this. The brothers in jail felt that that they were being abandoned by the West Coast, by by Huey and all of them, you know. And then you had, like I said, you had these knuckleheads over here, Thomas Jolly and Robert Bay were running the party, and all they were really doing was chasing skirts on the down low, you see. And um, and 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 so they felt this way. And the only people that that could try to disavow them of this was myself and Sedaweo, because every weekend. When we when we adjourn from court on Thursdays because we claim the religious exemptions for Friday, so we had three day weekends. I would fly as soon as court was over. I would fly to the West Coast. I would have to do a a, a cassette tape to give to Charles Gary, who was uh, Huey's lawyer, to take into Huey. 
Huey would respond to the tape and I would sit with David and get my um, uh, marching orders, so to speak, around the things, the report that I gave, you know, and this was every weekend until they, until they got afraid of me. And they got afraid of me because I became increasingly vocal and about how the 21 was being treated, how the East Coast Panthers were just selling papers and selling papers. They had, you know, they had a, a paper in their shoes in the winter. And Huey was in the penthouse on the West Coast with Elaine. And, um, and they was, you know, and they was, um, you know, popping game in the Lamp Post nightclub that they own in California. You know, I'm from New York. I'm from the South Bronx, you know, so I put my hustle on to in New York so that what happened over a period of months is that the Panthers on the West, on the East Coast, start wearing leather coats and slick gangster hats and had slick shoes on. They said, well, how y'all getting all this money, set, you know, selling papers? We didn't get the money selling papers. I was born here. I, I've been flat foot hustling since the day I was born, you see? So we went back to our roots, you see? And we didn't just sell papers. We started jacking dope dealers. We started leaning on on, 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 on scam artists who were pimping the party and all of these things. And this led us to become very popular in the so-called um, lumping class, the street, street brothers and sisters. And they would bring us all kinds of stuff to the office. You know, they would bring us coats. They would bring us that they don't jack <laughs> off, off, off the trailers, you know, and just, you know, and, and literally just give it to us for a song and a dance, you know. And these were drug addicts, true. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the rift between the the West Coast and the East Coast was a rift of, of, of socio- Socioeconomic adjustment. It, it there was a complete difference, and 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 the, and the brothers on the West Coast that started the party, they really had no no Pan African consciousness or even Black self identity. They were mm. responding to the vicious racist police in California, and they were responding with the, their right to defend themselves, and that's what in our in our in enabled me to, 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 to look at the Black Panther Party and say, well, when I got out of prison, that's what I was going to do. That's where I wanted to be. Because they took this uncompromising stand against these bullies in blue costumes. And if I, anything, I hate bullies. And I always hated them bullies in blue costumes in South Bronx because I grew up with them. I grew up getting beat in the head, thrown in, the, in, in Fort Apache basement. I grew up with them crackers. Huh? With, and, and Negroes. The biggest Cop on the on our corner, the most vicious cop was a cop called Two Dollar Brown. Yeah, huh? big old black bubble looking Negro. You understand? He used to bully us all the time until we threw an ash can from the fifth floor of apartment building down on that nigga's head, and uh, that stopped that. You see? And but what I'm trying to get at here is that there's a different. There was always this difference between the cultural and political and and black identity of the East Coast. And, and, and the lack thereof on the West Coast. In fact, they used to call us all pork chop nationalists because we had African names. They lumped us all together with, with Mama Lama Ron Karanga, that snitch ass, bald head, mother. Anyway, they, they lumped us all together with him. I know I'm supposed to be forgiving in my old age. I ain't supposed to be bitter, but I'm, 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 I'm cross as two sticks and bitter as quinine. So uh, I ain't gonna forget shit. So anyway, Having said that, what I'm trying to say is that um, the difference, the dichotomy between East and West Coast was reflected in Black culture and was reflected in Black political consciousness. This is why you see that the first confrontation that the Panthers had on the, on the East Coast were with cultural nationalists. Huh? Was with brothers, if you remember the Betty Shabazz episode, you know, the cultural nationalists showed up with empty guns, not the Panthers. They were on stage. They were you know, they were fronting. Hmm? That's what I said. There's certain people who were for real and certain people who were just acting at, 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 at the time. And you could always tell who, for, who was for real when the shooting started and who was acting. The stage cleared quick. 
when the shooting started. You see? By the way, the series starts by pointing, making this point in terms of Pac's realness by talking. It opens up by talking about the time he shot three or two cops in Atlanta in the butt. Uh, uh, um, and how he he got down on one knee as they were trying to run away, and he drew that pistol, and pop 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 like a like a trained like like a trained whatever they were describing. Oh, what, what, um, what and the that? point. So I forgot the what was it ninety three I want to say. So so again now if people his name was mentioned in the chat John Potash's version of this and the the the, the argument he brings to this is very different than we get in the series. His argument is is more in line with the COINTELPRO operation that was being attempted on Pac at that time, which is how you would he he uh, over I'm oversimplifying but it's how Potash explains how you could get away with shooting two cops uh, and not doing any time. Who um, who, who shot two cops? Pac Tupac. So he two oh, undercover where, cops. Where, where, he shot two cops where? In Atlanta in in 1993, I want to say was the year. And the the and and I don't remember the details. And the, the series doesn't go into it very much, which I thought was interesting because if you do get get John Potash's version, the the it, it involves um, this being part of a series of attempts by the state going back to early in Pac's life and career to to uh, uh, attack him in extension to the work that had been done against his mother, against you and everybody else. So, so that this was an operation where, where two undercover cops get involved in trying to shoot Pac. He gets one of their guns. This part is not explained in the series. They don't tell all this yet. Um, he gets one of their guns and as they try to run away, he pulls the gun and, and while and the, 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 the brother telling the story in the series says, None of us wanted to give Pac the gun as the cops were leaving. We wanted to let it let them go away, but but this is how real they're setting us up to understand Pac to be. So they said Pac gets the gun himself, gets out, gets on one knee as you would, you know, trained with a pistol in that way, blah, blah, blah. He get he hits the cops. They show them limping off coming out of the hospital later, which is kind of funny. But but the 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 um point is is that was I'm just sharing that to say that this is how the series opens up by telling us to trying to make a, a, a point that I think you're making, maybe not the same point, but that this is how real, this is how we should know that Pac is real, that he was not acting. Well, well, I don't, I don't know nothing about that. Yeah. But, I'm just sharing with you. I'm just trying to fill in I, some I, of the I, gaps I, as I we talk. Yeah. I can't comment on that episode, the veracity or non veracity of it. I don't even know if it happened. I don't know anything about that. And, oh, and, it, it, that part I'm, I, it, I'm that it happened. I don't think is questionable. The the circumstances surrounding why and how he got away with it, I think, is still up for discussion. I, but if, that did that incident did occur. Two, you're saying that these were two undercover cops? Yes, they were. They were out of uniform at the time. At at that this incident. So again, the series doesn't explain this, and I do not remember how Potash breaks it all down. He has a very detailed explanation for this. Um, but but all we get reminded of in the series is that and if anyone in the chat, I'll come back later. You can correct me if I'm misremembering any of this. But the that all we get in the series so far is that these two undercover cops, because it, 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 especially from the opening of the series, we're being invited. We're being told this story as it's happening by one of the uh, apparent eyewitnesses. And 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 they've pulled him over. They've. They've attempted to set him up to kill him. It it doesn't work. They're running away. He shoots and hits them both okay, in so the butt and the leg and something two, like these that. Were, these were two undercover uh, 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 police. I imagine they're black. Nope, two white, both white. Really? Yes, sir. <laughs> so he shot. So so he's supposed to have, um, um, shot two undercover white cops who were trying to set him up or kill him or whatever. Now, Potash, Potash says, if I remember correctly, Potash's reason, the reason he explains this doesn't get exposed and Pac gets away with it is because the gun he gets from them that he uses to shoot them could be connected to another murder that would have then exposed these cops have been involved in all kinds of dirty okay. setting things so up. So that's how he explains. Something like that is how okay. Potash explains so it. So, so the, the, the rationale is that they tried to kill him. He took man. He, yeah. he took a gun from one of them, 
and he shot this cop. And the reason why nothing really became of it is because the cop had a gun that was involved in the murder of somebody else. That he, that Something he, like that. Potash, I'm, I'm trying to remember very quickly. It's because none of this is discussed in the series is my point. They don't, they don't explain any of this. So if you're just watching the series, it would leave you to wonder, I would think, how does Pot get away with shooting two Atlanta two white Atlanta cops and not go to jail? How does that happen? How did they, even how did the incident even start? I don't they don't really explain any of well, this. Well, I you, like like I said, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't want to um you know, let me just say this here, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. That's right. I'm I'm again, my my apologies. Pac was into this is why this is I'm sorry, this is part of how they're setting us up to understand Pac is real. Pac was intervening against two white cops who are harassing a black man. That's how he gets himself. That's how we're said. That's right. That's how we're told this thing gets started. So he, he was intervening in a in he a, saw a black man getting he, harassed by two black, white men. He didn't he realize who they were cops. They were they were out of uniform, not undercover. Kalaji's right. They were not, they were out of uniform. And he intervenes, and that's how all of this gets started. So there was an that's right. He, he intervened. It was an altercation. He wound up taking one of their guns and, and shooting them, right? Yes. yes. I think that's yes. I mean, yes. you do you believe that? I'm more, no, I'm, I more believe Potash's version. I, I, when I heard, when I remember reading his book years ago and then interviewing him several, several times, I just remember walking away from that thinking that version makes more sense than any of this stuff that we're getting. Now, I, I, I think I understand where you're headed, but I'm just saying it because it, 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 yeah, that version that we got in this series makes less sense to me. And this is in than, 1993? Yes. So when did Tup when was Tupac killed? 1996. Three years later. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, like I said, all that's not real is camouflage. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it might be, it may be true. I, I don't know. I never heard of a black man intervening with two undercover white cops and shooting them, and <laughs> and, and, and that was the end of, especially some more of of that notoriety. That's why Potash's version made sense to me that they were un they were looking to keep at something else suppressed. Um, well, if you remember, if you remember the case of this brother, I you know my, his first name is his name um, slips me at the moment on the on the East Coast here, who used to, who the police uh, had dealing drugs for him and he flipped on them, and um and he and he shot two of them. And they came, they sent a SWAT team to arrest him and he escaped. They wanted to kill him because he had information about the NYPD using, you know, redistributing drugs from their, you know, from their catches in New York. And they wanted to kill this young man. Um, his name, I know his name. You talking about Larry Davis? Larry Davis. Yeah. Now, Larry Davis didn't have no notoriety, notoriety like Tupac Shakur. Correct. And Larry Davis, you know, uh, his 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 initial um, uh, contradiction was that he decided he wasn't gonna sell dope for the popo no more, and that he was gonna tell all, and they wanted to kill him as a result. Now, you put that together with this story that you just gave me about Tupac, and you asked me, and Larry Davis is dead now. He was in the joint uh, with me briefly. I remember how they used to take him out to sell it and chain him to the cell door to open the door literally he was like he was like that dude in the, um that 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 mass killer what was Dahmer Jeffrey Dahmer oh yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. They, come out. they used to gag and mask put a mask over his head chain him to the door open him with the on to the door they abused this man and they killed this man and this was for somebody who was trying to get out from under the uh, the, uh, the police and he escaped and it was self and you know he won that case in court he won that self defense yes and that really made them angry and they had to get them on something up. Now, if you tell me that two white cops was, was, was abusing somebody, I wouldn't, I wouldn't care if they had, if they, if, if, if they were protecting the Lindbergh kidnapper, you tell me that they were intervening. Tupac jumped in this out of the Claire Booth car. And because he was Tupac, you know, and that, and they was involved in some of the more nefarious uh, stuff. You know, nothing ever came of this. And those two cops just went to the hospital. You know, they got their compensation and they went on about their business. Now, I ask you, you believe that now. 
And why was that even thrown out there? That was thrown out there to say, essentially, I believe, that Tupac was genuinely um, uh, in the spirit of the Black Panther Party. And yes. also uh, committed to defending that, Black people at all costs, yes. And, and we know that's not true. Okay, and 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 so in order to do that, is 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 because you need a generation. I mean, there's a generation that grew up, you know, loving this man and his music and and how and how significant it was to them when they were growing. Mm -hmm. And I get that. Every generation has a soundtrack, you know. And many of us, many of us watched, you know, artists that we, you know, that we enjoy die young. You know, and I, you know, say, damn, tragically, suicide, murder. Look how Sam Cooke went out. You see, I mean, uh, 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 Marvin Gaye. You, you, you see what I'm saying? But when it comes to Tupac, this is real. And when it comes to Tupac, and I ask this of other folks, you know, when it comes to Tupac, nobody says that you know Marvin Gaye, whose 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 who's imprint or his impact on on black music is phenomenal. Hmm? Oh man! But uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Daruba. Wait, hold on, you're muted still. Hold on, you gotta mute you. Unmute, unmute, unmute. It's still muted. Why is it still showing you're muted? Yeah, you have to unmute. I can't unmute you. Okay. Sorry. There you go. There you go. What I'm trying to get at. Is I can't, I don't know about the veracity of the story, mm -hmm. but I do know, you know, that um, that um, I could understand how um, how a Faini, you know, you know, succumb to that to drug addiction in the way she did, and how that impacted her son. You know, and how that could impact her son, and how that when she got over that addiction, and she was able to secure some time with her boy, in his life, you know that that meant a lot to her, you know, and I got that, you know, and and I understand that that Tupac, you know, was a troubled kid. He 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 grew up, he grew up, you know. He was a sensitive, troubled kid. But Tupac, from my understanding, he was no he was no, he was no gangster. He was playing like he was. He was on stage. And he, and he took it to the and he took it to the max. And the max waxed his ass. I think the series tries to make that point, actually. In, a, in, a, in as much a loving way as they can, because they, they, I mean, they, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm saying, what love got to do with it? Mm -hmm. Love ain't got nothing to do you. with this. Love mm -hmm. ain't got nothing to do with that. I mean, uh, 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 whatever Afeni Shakur's faults or whatever Tupac's shortcomings, whatever they whatever Afeni's, you know, none of us are perfect. Whatever her faults was, she was on the right side of history. Huh? And that's what matters, whatever Huey's faults were. And he had some. And 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 I mean, here's a man that wanted to kill my ass. So, so you know, whatever they were, Huey P. Newton was on the right side of history. And you can never take that away from him. And I would never I would argue with anybody that would try to take anything away from these brothers and sisters who stood against these pigs when they did, and I was with them. When we did this, I'm not. I don't care what you say about their shortcomings. Yeah, they had them. Yeah, he felt. But we all process that defeat, that loss differently. And if mm. Annie couldn't, pro she processed it her way. And that drug addiction was a consequence of that process for her. You see what I'm saying? And Tupac had to adjust to that. He had to deal with that. When Tupac went to prison here in New York, it was by sheer. Um, um, and and myself and 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 um and uh, what's the name Noah in prison who put the Y out in prison that nobody should mess with this brother at all. He was our he was our he was our family. Hmm? Hmm. And nobody and the pigs realized that and they threw they threw Tupac in isolation. Talking about they put him in isolation for protection. He didn't need no protection. His protection was the black political prisoners in New York State. 
who everybody respected. Criminals, axe, axe murderers, and everybody. You see? And, 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 and so, you know, I just feel sorry that, that, that a generation that, that needs so badly to have um, those revolutionary eye, um, uh, images grasp at straws because before Tupac, you know, there was X Clan. There was public was, enemy. So they do something. By the way, you mentioned X Clan. I just want to say very quickly uh, um, X Clan is pictured without being named very quickly, as is Sonny Carson. And I thought that was a, an interesting choice to to that had to clearly have been made consciously to do that. Uh, which is part of the problem that I have with, with and why I love being able that we can talk to you uh, because it's, it's the, East Coast, West Coast stuff that we're talking about. But, if, you, but, if you have a real history of the of, of what happened with the Black Panther Party and, and you understand the split was not just between in the Black Panther Party was not just something that was engineered by COINTELPRO between New York and the West Coast. Half of the Black Panther Party in the South and other places, half of the membership were not under the leadership of 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 of, of the West Coast at at the beginning of the split. Every people have to be. Somebody born. tell David Hilliard to stop blowing up your phone during this conversation. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't David. <laughs> I know. He keep calling to interrupt this interview. Tell, tell David to hold on a few minutes. No, I'm just playing. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that um, that 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 it, it it was more complicated than that. You know, if you go to the po if 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 you look at the police's the police account or the Black Liberation Army the origin, they have they have the resistance of the BLA broken down into what they call what they train their officers back in the '90s into the what they call the BLA wars, the first and second BLA war. I mean, they actually broke this shit down in their training to new cops about how it is. But you got to remember, back in the day, they never called the Black Liberation Army terrorists because to, to use the term terrorist would mean that we had politics. What we were doing was political. OK, they only used the term criminal uh, haters of, of, of anything in blue. And, you know. So what they did, they made movies of the black cop and the white cop. What was that? Uh, Foster and Laurie, they made a movie out of that, you yeah. know, and how they loved each other and they died together at the hands of these criminal fanatics, you see? Now, the West Coast board partly bought into that because it was convenient for them to distance themselves from the idea of self-defense, armed self-defense. Huey was talking about that revolution pending, pending, um, a survival pending, re pending revolution. What the, what's that? Huh? Back in the bullwhip days, what was he saying? Survival pending emancipation. So therefore we shouldn't resist. We shouldn't try to escape no more. We shouldn't kill these crackers that was killing us. Huh? So that was the issue. And that was the issue because the West Coast had to get out of the paradigm of being the root and the basis and the leadership of the black movement based on our ability for armed self-defense. And if you talk about self-defense as, 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 as we did, you would understand, too, that self-defense meant also offense. There's no such thing as, as self-defense without a good offense. Hmm? So that meant that for the BLA, for us, if you killed, if you killed us, if you killed our people, if you murdered us, there was a consequence, and that consequence wasn't just a raised fist talking about no justice, no peace. That consequence wasn't just marching down the street. That consequence wasn't chasing ambulances like like Fat Al back then. That wasn't the consequence, you know, a settlement in court. The consequence was there was going to be funerals on both sides, and there was funerals on both sides. And that's what's missing today. There's only funerals on one side. We get settlements in court now. Hmm? We get multi-million dollar settlements and the beat goes on and, 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 and the notion that you could reform police in America still persists. This, th these are the armed agents of the state. Just like the military. They're the armed agents of the state. Let that sink in. 
armed agents of the state. They are not workers. They are not amenable, amenable to reform. They have their own culture. They have their own. They look at the community as them against us. That's how the police think, because they're armed agents of the state, and they got to think that way. How are they going to break up working class strikes? How are they going to beat up working class people and poor people if they don't see themselves as an authority over and above those people they're beating up? Hmm? So when we talk about the centralization of police, when the Black Panther Party talked about it, we wasn't just talking about um, changing. Oh, I'm coming in too. Um, he should be here shortly. Yeah, he's on the phone. Yeah, tell him he could go. Ed too. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. It's all good. So, so what it's I'm saying good. is, now I know, I know, I may sound, I may sound like a blast from the past or some archaic bit of Negro over here. Do you understand? But I firmly believe, and history has shown that that white supremacy is not going to go away. It's not going to be reformed until you overthrow it and destroy it, smash it up for eternity. And this is why NATO is in Africa. This is why you have the wars, you have America at war with people of color and supporting all of these reactionary authoritarian regimes is because they don't want to give up that control and, 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 and the system of white supremacy that they created worldwide. So now when we talk about somebody like Tupac, um, who was born into a white supremacist construct in which his mother was a member of an organization that advocated black self-defense and the dialectics of black self-defense. Remember, all of those people that were talking on the, in the interviews were talking about how political education in the Black Panther Party was mandatory, right? Yep. They were talking about, I mean, you had Jamal talking about how <clears throat> he first joined the party. He was given a whole bunch of books to read. He thought he was going to get a gun, you know, yep. all of this stuff. That's what he said, okay? Then you had Shaba Om talking about, uh, uh, um, uh, um, you know, how, we used to read Mao. What was one of the first things that we understood in Mao? Ask any of them. Not we didn't understand one of the first things was to feed the kids, was to feed uh, uh, the children breakfast, huh? If anybody fed our kids breakfast before school, they would have took it. Didn't have to be the Black Panther Party. It's the same way on the West Coast. People were hungry. People didn't have nothing, huh? So if anybody would have came along and did that, you know, if if you know. If, if the tooth fairy would have came along and was giving breakfast to, to our kids, they would have took it, you see? So there was nothing revolutionary about the breakfast program. Hmm? There was nothing revolutionary about the 10-point program. The 10-point program is just as relevant today as it was yesterday. Go read it. Huh? We got black faces in high places right now. We got more black people in positions of power than we ever had in our history. And then when a black man gets killed in most of these cities, who's the police chief? A black man. Who's the mayor? A black woman or a black man. Who's the DA? A black man or a black woman. Who's the lawyer representing the agreed family? A black man who ain't never won a case, but he get plenty of settlements. <clears throat> That's a win. Yeah. yeah, money, money, money talks, bullshit walks. I get it. You see? But don't make like, you know, the essence of the Black Panther Party's program and self-defense was an understanding of the state that political power grows out the barrel of a gun. So that's why I keep saying that that these films are these 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 documentaries, and I and I do want to come back to that question of of your comrade seeing this more as a film than a documentary, because to me the fact that it's displayed or presented as a documentary adds to the level of sophistication that I'm saying is becoming more of a problem, because it's it's I mean it's so well produced. Everybody looks and sounds good. Everything is is well shot. The scenes everybody's in are, are perfect. Everything is the editing is immaculate, Daruba. I mean, this shit is some. This shit is. That's this why, shit is. That's why I told you. It, that's why I told you I didn't want to see it, and that's why you noticed I wasn't in it. And that well, that was my next question. Did you? Why didn't they? Get, well, I didn't say why, but I was going to ask. Did you get a call? They didn't call you. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> Bro, listen. Because they do something slick. I mean, you do, like, somebody in the chat pointed out that it was actually made four years ago and it took them this long, whatever. Yeah, I, that's to what out. I, I told. Right. What, yeah. Because you I see blood is still in there, but, but, 
but they don't talk about the BLA. They just have one clip of him saying something like passingly, like only a few of us were silly enough to get involved with the guns, almost to counter the point you're making here. They mm -hmm. make it seem like it was no, the silly lunatics yeah, in the yeah, party the that, that did all fringe. of that. It was the lunatic <clears throat> fringe that understood that white folks wasn't going to stop killing us until there was funerals on both sides. And that police brutality was not an exception. It was the rule. The police are doing their job when they terrorize and beat us and kill us. That's their job. We act like that ain't their job. So we get all upset when a young boy come across the street and the police accost him and beat him up and throw him down on the ground and strangle him down near to death when he just asked the question, what did I do? Mm. What you did was you don't understand that we running this stuff here and if you don't do what we tell you to do, we will beat you into the cement. Mm. Hmm? And what did I say from the beginning about the Black Panther Party and why I joined? I didn't like bullies. Never did. You see? And so what 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 happened, you know, the reason why folks have to distance themselves from that. And do you notice that white folks ain't distancing, distancing themselves from the fact that armed self-defense and, and, and political power grows out the barrel of a gun? Look at the look at the legislation they're passing now about gun safety, how they got to fight just for that. All of these things. Huh? White folks are armed to the teeth. And black folks is talking about stop the violence in the hood. Hmm? The violence in the hood is cre was 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 manufactured and, and 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 is maintained because you don't have a Black Panther Party or a BLA in the hood. That's why. Hmm? When when Fred was in when Fred was in um, Fred Hampton was in Chicago, you know, they tried to set him up, tried to set up the. Uh, uh, tried to set him up for murder at the hands of of, of of the Chicago street gang, Jeff Fortner. But Fred was so shrewd, he flipped it on him. He actually met with Jeff Fort, saying, now look, man, you don't want to do this. Because this ain't, you know, this ain't this ain't gonna end well. Not for me. It ain't gonna end well for you. You see? And Jeff Fort was like, what? Man, all these all these street niggas I got out of here armed to the teeth. This nigga talking about it ain't gonna end well for me. Yeah. Because could just imagine what we could do together. Hmm? That's why, that's where the idea and the notion of the Rainbow Coalition came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. We weren't allying ourselves with white folks in Appalachia that wouldn't shoot back. Huh? We weren't allowing ourselves with Puerto Ricans and Latinos who wasn't about decolonization of Puerto Rico and, and, and defending themselves. Huh? Everybody in the in the in the uh, Rainbow Coalition believed in the right of armed self-defense. Everybody in the Rainbow Coalition believed that we should control public safety and the police in our community. Huh? And so when we talk about something, um, uh, 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 why people are uh, bend over backwards to show how the Black Panther Party was basically, you know, feeding kids, doing health care. We did all of that. Uh huh. We did all of that. And why did we do it? For the same reason that Mao Zedong and other revolutionaries took their struggle to the most oppressed people in their community and educated them and lifted them up to resist those oppressors, oppress, oppressive forces in their midst, whether it was the landlords in China or whether it was the comp comprador class in the Philippines or wherever, okay? And we did the same thing, okay? So looking out for our people, you know, feeding them, comes with revolutionary love, comes with a commitment of, 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 of in, in empowering our people. But at the same time, the enemy, white folks don't understand nothing until you put your foot in their mouth. They don't get it. And you don't, y'all can sit up here and talk all of that yik yak stuff if you want to. Hmm? Watch how the conversation changes when there's funerals on both sides. What, what, what happens when the PBA got to call a, 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 a crump for defense? Hmm? <laughs> so they can get settled. <laughs> when's the last time you, when's the last time you saw the, <laughs> I can't. that should sound absurd. I, I right? know it does, right? I was just trying to picture that. Like, 
<laughs> talking about we got a settlement for the family of the, of uh, the slain of the, the, the slain. <laughs> Oh they don't have God. to do that because because he was slain in the line of duty and he has all the right, folks to go to his right. family. Why? Because they have a union. And there's and and to your point, there there are representatives of the state, so the state takes care of them to that extent. Well, I didn't um, get that part. I got a call. I was just saying that to your point that you you as you were making you, you said that the police are the armed agents of the state, so they have the state. They're they're state sponsored and therefore have the support of the state when, when when you know when necessary. Um, and so we didn't. <clears throat> just quickly, Drew, Drew, the, the, the when folks in the chat who've seen the series, when they make mention of Tupac going to uh, Marin City, that is Marin County, right, California, right? Because all because because we all heard the same thing without reference to that to that to that particular moment in Black August history, right? Um, uh, which I thought was another interesting moment because I was just asking the chat, Daruba, in the series, they make mention of Tupac at one point early in his life, moving out to California and, and moving to Marin City. And they talked about how there was, you know, um, the, 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 the one side of the city was rich and white and he was in the, the black and poor side of Marin City. And that... But they didn't mention Marin County, and of course they didn't mention Marin County Courthouse. So I just was asking the chat if that was in fact the same, because all I know of when I yeah. hear Marin is the one. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We yes, need sir. to ask ourselves, and this is one of the things um, the sister pointed out to me. We need to ask ourselves, you know, when we talk about Tupac's politics, if Tupac is, was genuinely anti-capitalist and anti, I mean, here's a guy that's talking about poverty and poor people not having things. Tupac wanted to be successful. He wanted to be, he wanted to be some something. He wanted to be recognized as being somebody, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and he was, and he was good at that. Okay. But you can't sit up here talking about you anti-capitalist and how these crackers is exploiting us and you got diamond rings on all five of your fingers and, and gold chains around your neck. And you don't own no goddamn gold mine here or a diamond mine. Nor so, so, so what about the point that has been mentioned by, by Pac supporters for a long time and that they allude to in this series, that this was part of the performance that was being presented in league with uh, support from others like uh, Matulu Shakur, who they do mention, um, not as a political prisoner per se, even just released, but but as a as a uh, uh, as someone who gave behind the scenes meaning to Thug Life to the Thug Life Code, and they do acknowledge that Pac struggled know. with that. He was I a young man. He was con so but anyway. But, but anyway. I don't know about I don't know all about that. All mm -hmm. I do know. Is what the Pope is, is what the I got 300 over 300,000 pages of FBI files at Princeton University right now, right? And it's prison letters now, okay? I'm getting ready to be a curator for Princeton's Cointel profiles. Hmm? And I can tell you right now, okay, <clears throat> that um, you have people that's, that's trying to rewrite history and meld organizations and ideologies together that would never functionally together like that at that historical moment huh matulu shakur you know it was was brilliant acupuncturist he came out of the rna okay republic of new africa okay mm -hmm. the whole idea of doing acupuncture in new york came out of came out the whole idea of administering to poor people the type of quality health care that they needed especially with drug addiction came out of a project called Think Lincoln in 1969, 68-69. It was, it was at, at that time that the Young Lords in Manhattan and the Black Panther Party in Harlem in New York took over the Lincoln Hospital Detox Center. We bum rushed it, occupied the building for weeks. And we while we occupied the building, we started a whole new program of non-addictive drug rehabilitation. This was a direct threat to methadone that had just came out and that was being bandied about as the solution to heroin addiction. If anybody knows anything about the history of the, uh, on the East Coast, especially, of how the heroin epidemic devastated New York, devastated Chicago and Philly, devastated it. It was a plague. 
And what did the state come up with? State drugs, methadone. And now if you go down in the Harlem right now and you see all the methadone addicts, they look like zombies. Methadone was more addictive than heroin. And we knew that then. That's why we took over the Think Lincoln. We hooked up a, a, a clinic where the drug addicts had, were kicked cold turkey. And what was the first thing we did after they kicked cold turkey? We started our political education classes. We started reading Mao. We started reading Malcolm. We started playing tapes. We started watching movies like the Battle of Algiers. Hmm? That's, that was our rehabilitation of drug addicts. And then, you know, they couldn't let that stand. So it was out of this tradition and out of this history and out of, and out of this radical uh, uh, beginning that Matulu began to exercise his thing with the, with the acupuncture center and take it to a whole nother level, you see? And, and, and they had a program called the counter, uh, the COINTELPRO um, something program, right? And if you look at their COINTEL program, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, had a, they had what they called the COINTELPRO task force, right? And they were supposed to be dealing with the le leading COINTELPRO cases of the examples of how, you know, counterintelligence was used against radicals. And so you know what the leading, uh, Cohen, who's, what case was the leading COINTELPRO case? It was a white woman from the weather underground. My case was never even mentioned. Oh, you why you think that was? Read it in my book. <laughs> you know, there was a reason. Because we think that, you know, uh, all unity, that unity is about uniformity. And it's mm -hmm. not. You see, it's not about uniformity. So this is an attempt. So when we deal with with, with, with folks who want to bring this, this radical history together, they wanted to be, bring it together and so that we could sing some type of, I don't know, ancestral kumbaya, you know, about how all, all our ancestors were on the same page. There was, there was ancestors that wouldn't flee with Harriet Tubman, right? And there were ancestors who thought Harriet Tubman was a runaway and, and, they should, and we should be killing these crackers rather than running north. Right, there were John Browns. You understand, back then, hmm? there was white boys that was loping off the heads of, of, of plantation owners because because God Jesus told them to. Whatever you want to say, the head came off. You see, so my point is is that because we had a common enemy and because we struggled against this common en enemy at that time, means that um, Jesus Christ means that that another generation that comes behind us, they see these radical histories and these radical struggles and they try to see where they intersect. You know, they do it with Malcolm and, 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 and Martin. You know, they, everybody does that. Where did Malcolm and Martin meet? And if you notice, they'll go digging for a real photograph where they're together. What does that tell us? That they were together back then? Huh? That Malcolm and, and 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 Martin sat down and said, "Okay, you take you take the you take the wide receiver, and I'll take the running back, and we we're both on defense." It it wasn't like that. It's like that in our minds. It's like that because we want it to be like that. You see, we need to really understand what really happened, and that's not that that's not going to happen if those of us who live through it feel it's necessary to fudge events, to create myths, you know, to create false, false legends and, and iconically, uh, uh, iconic, iconic, how do you say that? Icon icons. Yeah, icons. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that's why it's impossible for, for, for what you saw in the series that you saw to actually, look, I mean, it's, imp it's, it's not practical to look at it as a documentary. It's a movie. It doesn't make sense as a documentary. You know? Mm. That, that, did, did that Foster and Laurie thing where they were black cop and white cop who died together at the hands of brutal barbaric uh, criminals, was that a documentary? 
Was that accurate? It was a movie. It was a movie, the Vietnam vet and how they loved each other. And they all came back to the police. They were going to serve the community. And oh, we all, come on, man, spare me that shit. Well, that's my point. If they did a movie, if they turned this series into a movie about Afeni Shakur and her son Tupac and did what the documentary does, have, have that be the focal point with the Panther Party and those politics sort of being the, the, the background context behind this, the film, that to me would be easier to dismiss as the stealth history that-, that, that But why? You just talk about how well it was done. Because that's except, my point. Except, but, but, no, but come reality. No, because if it, because if it's a movie, people are it's it's it may be even a very well done movie. It's still easier for for this conversation we're having to penetrate the fact that it's a film in people's consciousness for them to say, well, then they, then they would just respond, well, it's just a movie. Okay, you know, we get it. It's not supposed to do all those things, but a documentary series, a five part documentary with the label documentary gives it that level of authenticity but that how, I think makes it- Do you know how long that had to be in the making? And do you know how much money had to be put into each series and in and, and, and order to do that? That's my. That's what I'm saying. So, they put a lot of money into this. Okay. So if all of this money was put into a series to tell us, to show us, and it, do you remember the question I asked you earlier a couple of months Why ago? Why did he do it? No. Oh, no. no oh, wait, one, I'm sorry. Go name ahead. One rev, name one black revolution oh. that has come out of the hip-hop generation and where the hip-hop music was their soundtrack. Name one. So this would be where I, it, it depends how you judge revolutionary. If you're uh -huh. judging revolutionary based on your standard and what you all did, I don't think that context exists and I don't think it's fair to do that. But you would be right. You would still be right. Like I don't, I'm not aware of anybody in my generation rising to the level that you all did. Yeah, and you don't, and you're not aware of a soundtrack. You're not aware of a soundtrack neither that said power to the people. You're not aware of a soundtrack that said a change is gonna come. You ain't aware of a soundtrack that said shoot them before they run. Now you ain't aware of a soundtrack that that was to a people at a particular point in history, and we was tired of that shit, huh? And that if you shoot at us, we will shoot back. And and what's the name wrote a book like that? And this ain't nothing that we thought of. Our ancestors been doing that. The Ku Klux Klan didn't run down on everybody in the South because they knew there were some black folks that didn't want to hear that shit. And we'll shoot their ass if they come up on some porch with some burning cross. they burn their ass, you see? When when King had to go into areas where there were hostilities, I used to hear stories from Kwame Torre talking about how they used to go into the communities before and lay the groundwork so that the people would have a so the king, king and them King and King and he used to tell me King had had a shotgun up in his up in his living room. You see, mm -hmm. nonviolence was a tactic. Nonviolence was meant to organize people on a moral and an ethical ground above the reactionary violence of the state. And it was effective, but it had its limitations. Just like a hunger strike in prison has its limitations. You got some prison, let your ass starve to death. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you see? So, so you could only take a certain tactic and a certain strategy, but so far before you have to take it to the next level. And so when you talk about someone like, 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 um, like Tupac and his mother, you know, you're talking about a very, um, deep and 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 profound um uh, 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 relationship of dysfunction of psychological emotional dysfunction and 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 lot a lot of it was caused by the trauma of being of at least on his mother's part of being in a movement that was defeated nobody i mean nobody talked about why afeni didn't um uh, uh go with us I'll go with um, uh, uh, Setoweo to Algeria when she had the opportunity. She she chose not to. She made that decision. Nobody was going to force her, but she was involved in the planning from the beginning to the end. It wasn't like she was left hanging there by herself. She made that decision. You see? So the consequences come, therefore, from that. I didn't up in, in court. Oh. With his wife next to him, 
pregnant by somebody he doesn't even know. Wait, say that again, because you broke up a little bit. I, 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 I think I missed part of that question. I just want to make sure I heard that right. Yeah, go ahead. But let him know. You out by two forty one forty one. But I'm did you hear what I said? I, I, I didn't hear what you said, but I heard what, what was was just instructed for me to hear that you were gonna to have to leave in a, in a few minutes. So I it's all good, no problem. I, <laughs> you know, I appreciate that. Wasn't that wasn't meant for you. That wasn't meant for you to hear. She or meant for not for meant for me to hear, but meant for me to know that you needed for no, that. And I understand you if you gotta go. <laughs> yeah, she said you need to tell me. A life coach. My life coach, Tannik Hill Jones, told me, look, Negro, and all due you respect need to Tannik Hill, respect. And bounce out of here because you That's what I'm saying. She was telling, she was wanting me to, she needed you to let me know that it was going to have to end. That's all. In all respect, I appreciate that. Thank you, sister. Somebody got to keep it real. I thank you. <laughs> you know, otherwise, I'll be George Jack in the four o'clock. Exactly. Exactly. I'm uh, not mad. I hear it. That's what I'm saying. I don't know what to do with y'all, man. Y'all want some y'all want some stupid shit, man. So listen, let me just say this. The the series has three more parts. I will work around your schedule and and and, and whatever my mechanic kill allows to occur, we will work around that and, and come back and 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 we can continue this because the series, because my point is if the series is going to keep hitting us with the nonsense we need to have you come back and try to to balance that out so but that said make your go ahead and say the, the, the last saying, thing you want to I'm, say for today I'm, I'm yeah want to, i don't want to come off like um i don't want to come off like understanding tupac and his mother and and what they went through and the trauma they went through the confluence of 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 repression, dehumanization, you know, criminalization, and and Tupac trying to, you know, grow up and be somebody, mean something, and how the influence of his background, you know, um, inform that. I'm not trying to do away with that, but what I want the, uh, the audience to understand is that when we look at accounts like this, this that's made really slick with a lot of money, you know we understand that creative license is going to take precedent. Not necessarily truth in, in, in the telling because we're living in the age of, of, of weaponized uh, uh, data. We're living in the age of the algorithm where people very seldom have a face-to-face -face relationship with each other politically. It's almost all on Facebook, um, Twitter, or whatever. So organizing is not like it used to be back in the day where you actually had to sit down and beef with people face to face. You had to go into the community. You had to get into the house and get into the move into the building. If you're going to tell the tenants to resist the landlord and you're living in another building, that ain't going to work. You had to move in that building and resist the landlord with them. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And and that's why you see that Afeni was involved in in, in in helping us deal with the teacher strike, in it with the with the um, with the uh, um, um, teachers union in New York, mm -hmm. led by arch Zionists, by the way, Albert Shanker, you mm -hmm. see, and 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 so yeah, so she had to be involved in that because the Harlem branch that was our policy, we all did that. You see, and so, but to say that that you know the sister you know represented this leadership in the, in the New York chapter was a complete misunderstanding of how the New York chapter was after we were arrested. It was not being run by 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 brothers and sisters in New York. It was being run by surrogates from west from the West Coast who didn't know jack shit about New York. Hmm? Mm -hmm. That's why when the split went down, the first thing that happened was that they were run out of New York. Literally. They were getting on the plane and run, I mean, they were trying to get, <laughs> they were trying mm -hmm. to get on the plane so fast that the FBI busted and thought they was going to hijack the plane. Oh, damn. Because they had guns on them when they got on the plane. <laughs> so, so, so two of them got got three years in jail right here in New York and all the time they was in jail in New York they was in protective custody oh wow I mean the people just don't get it 
that the destruction of the Black Panther Party of COINTEL, the, the force of COINTEL Pro was brought down on the Black Panther Party, not because we were just feeding kids, but because we believed that self-defense of our communities meant con community control of the armed agents of the state in our community. And if we couldn't control them, then they had to be put in check. And that's how it worked. You see, and there's certain people that couldn't handle that because it got really thick. Huey and them got out of prison. Huey just didn't get out of prison and he was crazy. Huey surrounded himself by people on that West Coast, like Lane Brown and Hilliard and all of them, who wanted Huey to survive, who wanted the Central Committee to be to 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 be to, to remain. A lot of folks don't understand that Fred Hampton wasn't just killed because he was an articulate leader in Chicago. Fred Hampton was killed because the government understood that the Central Committee in California was going to be democratized. That's what we were struggling for. That's what I was struggling for. That that the Central Committee should have leadership from all over the country on it, representing the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party, rather than just people from California. OK, and the government knew that and the government knew if that worked, then the Black Panther Party would become a much more dynamic and a much more grassroots organization. And so what happened was the split. And what happened, all of those individuals in the different areas in Chicago and different places, those who remained were brought to California, put in intensive programs of political education and, and worked for what for the next few years? The election of Lane Brown and Bobby Seale to electoral office. That's where they wanted to go. They wanted to go to electoral office. And that's what, you know, survival pending revolution meant to them on the West Coast. And whenever you see a reunion of the Black Panther Party for the last 10 or 15 years, you have never saw the East Coast represented in those reunions and in the programs and in the project. Why? Because we were in the tradition of Malcolm. We were in the tradition of Marcus Garvey. We had politics. We had pan-African politics. We believed in ourselves as African people. We, not, we didn't just believe in ourselves as black people living in the hood. You see, we understood that we were domestic, colonized people. So we acted that way. That's why we had African names. That's why we had culture and politics. You see? The West Coast, they didn't come to it like that. They were country boys for the main part, you understand, who didn't want to take, stop. they were tired of taking shit off of them cops. And Huey was no punk, you see. So he stepped inside of history and said, man, you know, I'm going to beat up on you guys. Y'all, look at the videos of Huey, how he, how he taunted the police. He would just wish they would go for their gun. And that inspired all of us. You see, so what I'm trying to say is here you had cultures that one from the East Coast that was deeply seated in black culture, black, black consciousness, um, African culture, music, jazz. All of this stuff came out the East Coast, out of New York, out of Philly, out of Chicago. That's Midwest. But, I, you know, it came out of East Coast. Where did hip hop start? Huh? South Bronx. East Coast. It didn't start in Compton. By the time it got to Compton, what was it? Gangster rap? Huh? NWA and all of that stuff. I was in the penitentiary, so I can't speak on that. I know one thing, that the kids coming into the penitentiary when I was in there for 19 years increasingly became psychotic and demented. They became unable to deal with, with, with anything other than their their, their feelings and their emotions, and they couldn't even handle being alone with themselves in a cell. So that would be, and I know you got to go. So I just want to say that th that would be the only area that we can pick up on where where if if I if I ever slightly disagree, it's on that point, and that's why I'm saying that we haven't seen the form of revolutionary that in in my generation that we saw in yours. Um, but but. Thanks to Mama Tannikill and and thanks to you, Daruba. I, seriously, man, I, 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 it is invaluable to be able to reach to you, reach out to you as often as we do, and I appreciate it. And I can't wait till the next time. So so travel well, be safe, uh, and uh, whenever we can make the next one happen, we'll do it. I'm gonna keep watching this series. So.
you go. Oh, and I just want to. I use that as an excuse. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Shout out to you guys before I go. I just want to thank everybody that that that, that helped with the GoFund. And, and yeah, I'm, no doubt. You know, I'm you know big up to y'all, man. And you know, it, I it's it's it, it, I can't express it really. It's hard to express. And so I just don't want to. Um, I you know I, I appreciate that. I, I'm going back. I'm going back Tuesday. Um, another comrade, another friend of mine's his funeral is tomorrow, and mm. and you know Blood's Blood's memorial is on the twenty twenty eighth. So I'll be in Africa. So um, I'm going to hopefully participate by Zoom. You know, and I'm just saying, you know, I, I you remember I gave you that. That 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 organization or some publishers that were t that were publishing BLA material and they were mm -hmm. they wanted to you know no one could ever find out who these people are you know and they were printing material on the BLA this mixed with the politics of the RNA this mixed with the politics of 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 um, other left wing uh, black organizations you see. And and so this is what I mean about how history, how recent history. This ain't no ancient history because some of us are still alive. You see, that's why certain things are and said while we're still alive because we could comment on them. It's like you picked up the phone and said, "Yo, did this really happen?" <laughs> <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? So when yeah, absolutely. So when you're dead, you got to dial up mm. an ancestor and say, "Well, what did he say about this back then?" You see what I'm saying? So yeah, man. You know, I just wanted folks to understand that you know that when it, with the series that they're looking at with Tupac may be very creative and undoubtedly it might have information that inspire and perhaps you know touch uh, 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 certain people. I know it would touch a lot of sisters who identify with Afeni and what she had to go through, you know, and and rightly so. And, you know, that's cool, but just not get this twisted. We lost that one, huh? Mm. And the reason why we lost that one, because we didn't have a generation to pick up that gun. You can call it what you want. You can call, oh man, what did you do about the gun? Huh? Where's NATO? If NATO is in Africa, in the Sahel. Did NATO come into existence for Africa? Nah, it came into existence for the Soviet Union. And now it's in the Sahel. And what are they doing in the Sahel? They're running the French out. And how are they running them out? With rhetoric? With academic study, they're running their crack ass out there with guns. And if we understand how we need to deal with our community, we need to have control of public safety. We need to control the armed agents of the state in our community. So it might not be the Panthers out there on the front line, you know, with 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 a revolutionary theater, because the gun for the Panthers was part of revolutionary education. It wasn't. We just didn't carry it because we were on some macho posturing. Although you have sisters that would say that now, that we was just macho posturing and us and the police had a lot in common because we both macho posturing. Look, well, please, you understand? The guns were loaded. And they did. They will kill your ass, you see? So it wasn't just about posturing. And that was the problem with Tupac. He was playing a role. He was he was on the stage acting. But the, but the, but, but the play was serious. It was about life and death. And sadly... Mm -hmm. He came up short. He wasn't killed because he had most consciousness and this was a COINTELPRO setup. Look how he was killed in a, in, in a spontaneous beef in Las Vegas in a hotel, in, in a gambling casino with some thugged out criminals, with some thugged out uh, Negroes that had no politics. Sugar Knight didn't have no real politics. And who they had in the interview talking about Tupac and oh, how real he was? Snoop Dogg? Hmm? Dr. Dre? And his, in his, uh, yeah, his, his, his cousins, his cousins. Yeah. Seriously. <clears throat> Seriously. Now that they're millionaires, now that I mean, now that they're icons. I mean, Snoop Dogg runs the runs the NFL entertainment program now for halftime. You see? Do you think if Tupac was alive? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Tupac was alive that he would have that 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 he would have brought his mama out on stage at the NFL? So this is my mama, Rafaini Shakur, mama. I, everybody, I'm gonna play my song. I love my mama. I love my mama. Do you think that that? Huh? Huh? You think so? No. 
Mm-hmm. So let's not get it twisted. Perception is not necessarily reality. Is right it? on. So anyway, hey. I, I got to No, I know you got to go. Thank you. For, thank you very much. Shout out to Mama Tannikill again. Thank you. We'll, we'll wrap it to you as soon as possible. Oh, and, 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 if, and I think you should talk to Mae Jackson, too, because fortunate, uh, you know, Tupac lived with Mae Jackson for, for some time. And a oh, famous too. Yeah. And so she has some really interesting insights into a, with with Afani and 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 how she processed stuff, you know, and 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 so yeah, I mean it gives pe- people a more under uh, intimate understanding that what they saw for the few series represented only part of the story. You That's see? right. Yeah. It was a movie. Right. It wasn't a documentary. It wasn't documenting historical facts. Mm. And then we have to ask ourselves, who makes history, men or women, or do history make men and women? Do they make, do people make history, or does history make people? That's the question. If history makes people, hmm? if history makes people and people don't make history, then what was Tupac? Like, like Richie Haven said, don't mind me, I'm nothing but a dream. So Tupac was a dream. To many people. He was a dream. He was a dream and he was a dream out of season. Mm. All right. All right, Daruba. Thank you very much. Travel right. well. Be safe, man. Take care of yourself. Talk to you soon. Okay. All good. right. Peace. All right, everybody. Hey, we fortunate. Very fortunate to get to rap with Daruba about this stuff. And thanks to, to Mama Tannikill again. And uh, we look forward to doing this again. I'll, you know, we all, I, you know, keep watching the series and, and uh, we'll reach back out to Daruba uh, as time permits. Um, thanks to Kenyatta again for the super chat. Thanks to everybody for coming through and for showing some love to, to especially to Brother Daruba. Uh, and, um, yeah. And a lot of stuff we didn't get to, obviously. So, you know, we'll do we'll we'll, we'll keep trying to do that uh, next time. And uh, thanks a lot. So make sure you stick around for the everything on the channel. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, uh, hit that bell notifications. Be back later on for Sundays with Ear Doctor. We'll be back tomorrow morning. Gorilla Intellectual University as me and Kalanji help lead this celebration or host this co-host this celebration of Mumia's birthday. A lot of special guests coming through tomorrow. It's going to be packed up. So, so, you know, whatever that means for you, make sure you're ready for that. So anyway, thanks everybody. Appreciate you coming through. Peace. Only if you're willing to fight for it, like, like Daruba just said, and Fred Hampton used to say, and we'll catch you next time here at I Mix with a Like and throughout the entire BPM platform. Thanks again, everybody. Peace. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.